Which ship is this? The tall masts. The very prominent four funnels. The sleek hull. If you said Titanic, you're wrong. This is the RMS Olympic, Titanic's sister ship. She was a near identical replica of Titanic with just a few altering accommodations. For instance, she had an open promenade deck while Titanic had an enclosed one. Olympic had a deck wing connected to the ship while Titanic's faced more out to the sides. Even the interiors were vastly the same. When you look at this photo of the Grand Staircase and it's claiming to be Titanic's, just know that this is actually Olympics. I'll get to why this picture is used more than an actual one later. In fact, most of the pictures of the interior claimed to be Titanic's are Olympics. Now besides her look, what was her story like? The day is June 7th, 1906. The largest ship in the world, the RMS Lusitania, has just been launched. She was a staggering 787 feet long. To put that into comparison, the ship before her, who held the record, the Empress of Scotland, was only 677 feet long. The Lusitania was not only the largest, but was also the fastest. The SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grasse held the record before her with a speed of 22 knots, 25 miles per hour. It doesn't seem that fast, but in 1906, that was speed at its finest. Why am I talking about this ship? The Lusitania was made by the company Cunard Line, and the rival company White Star Line noted that their rival had just made the largest ship in the world, and they wanted in. So the chairman of the company, J. Bruce Ismay, conceived the idea of three new revolutionary liners of the sea. He knew he could not make a faster liner, for it would either end in a draw or be too much money to even attempt to beat it. So he knew the competing edge would be size. And later, on December 15th, 1908, the keel for the newly named White Star Liner Olympic was laid in Harland and Wolf shipyard. Beside her, on March 31st, 1909, the keel for the Titanic was laid. The two were built essentially side by side. But finally, the day is October 20th, 1910, and the RMS Olympic is launched. Everyone knew at her launch that she was the largest vessel in the world, and she was. She really was. Despite being a wonderful spectacle, she was only half full on her maiden voyage on June 14, 1911. She left from Southampton, then hauled more passengers to Cherbourg, France, then Queenstown, Ireland, then finally reaching New York City on June 21st. It was an uneventful crossing, no speed record, just the largest man-made object in the world at the time, crossing the mighty Atlantic. But besides these, the passengers aboard her enjoyed endless space of amenities and novel luxury. On her fifth voyage from Southampton to New York, she was carrying 1,300 passengers just on her way to pick up another 800. In order to go pick up her extra passengers, she needed to go through the Solent, a strait in the United Kingdom. She had to execute a complicated turn, then the turn was executed and she started accelerating at nearly full speed in the middle of the Solent. At this time, a protected cruiser named HMS Hawk was traveling up the strait and eventually came up beside the Olympic. Olympic turned to starboard. For this caught the Hawk by surprise, for the Hawk was turned into port. Due to Olympic's water displacement, the Hawk was then sucked in by the current, having her bow being smashed into Olympic's stern. The Olympic was fit at that moment, unable to continue her voyage. Thankfully, she didn't sink the Hawk, so no damage was done to humans, just the ships themselves. Every day that was spent fixing her cost money and lost revenue. She would not continue her service for another six grueling weeks. The court ruled in favor of the Navy, and placed every single blame on the White Star Line. The argument was that the turn of the Olympic plus the speed sucked the Hawk into her wake. Before the Olympic's repairs, her sister the Titanic was launched on May 31, 1911. Repairs and construction was done on both ships side by side. Two looked essentially identical with Titanic's enclosed promenade not built in yet. 
Thus, both ships look the exact same from a distance. The confusion still leeches onto people today, which is why some have believed in the theory that is just simply called How do you tell a good lie? You mix elements of the truth with little sprinkles of salt of lies to make it more believable. The switch theory states that during Olympics repairs, the cost was way too high for it to completely be constructed again. How? It's a flippin' ho- So essentially what they did was they overinsured Titanic, switched the nameplates, then they would make Olympic with Titanic's name go on the regular scheduled crossing, sink it, and since it was overinsured, they would make back all the money they lost from Olympics repairs. A Titanic historian could debunk this theory in just one sentence. The Titanic was not overinsured. It was underinsured. The theory claims that it was done in a weekend, where all they did was add an enclosed promenade to the main exterior, paint on a new nameplate, call it a day. The reason as well, by the way, for the enclosed promenade was because when Olympic was sailing, passengers noted that the water splashed on them when they were walking near the front of the promenade deck. So an enclosed area for suites was added there instead. So workers had to come in with iron and construct these brand new building plans in just 48 hours. Remember when I said at the beginning that the two ships were near identical and how Titanic's interior and exterior images were of Olympic? That is because Titanic wasn't hyped enough by the public as Olympic was. So White Star Line just thought, we'll just use the photos from Olympic's interiors for the newspapers. And this fact just adds more fuel to the conspiracy. I'll leave a link down below to a website that shows about the switch theory and how it is impossible. And if you do believe in the theory, okay. Just make sure you do your research next time. Olympics repairs delayed her sister's maiden voyage, but finally, things were settled on April 10th, 1912, when Titanic left Southampton, England and headed to Cherbourg, France, then finally picking up extra passengers in Queenstown, Ireland. She would then sail on to New York City, becoming White Star Line's newest and finest liner. They finally had a two-ship service much like the Lusitania and her sister Mauritania. At the time, Titanic was the largest ship in the world. That would be cut short. On the night of April 14, 1912, Titanic struck an iceberg and was immediately lost, making a revolutionary event in ocean crossing history and a devastating blow for White Star Line once again. Only a couple months after Titanic sinking, the keel for the third ship was laid down, the RMS Gigantic, and now Olympic can finally have a running mate for Atlantic crossings. Surprise, Archie Franks Ferdinand was murdered, and hey look, Germany resented Britain's control of the world's ocean and markets, and hey, they have U-boats now that can sink massive ships. World War I is now here. In August 1914, when Olympic was making a westbound crossing, she received a wireless message signaling that Britain had declared war with Germany, and like many other merchant ships, were instructed to dim their lights and head to the nearest neutral port for refuge. In October, she was brought to Harlan and Wolf Shipyard, where she went through a 10-month conversion after being requisitioned to be a troop carrier, fitted with her own custom dazzle paint. Ship 2210 was finally tasked with carrying 6,000 troops to the Mediterranean to support the Gallipoli campaign. During this time as well, Olympic sister Gigantic would be named Britannic because it seemed more humble for supporting the Brits. And that ship was requisitioned to become a hospital ship. The Canadian government requested the use of Olympic to transport Canadian troops to assist in the war. The port of Halifax, where the most of the Canadian troops were stationed, was not ready for such a large vessel like Olympic. She needed an expensive amount of coal and workers for her. It lasted a full six days instead of the usual three to get Olympic up and running for her crossing back to Europe. The voyage was very strict on what could be done. For any ship crossing the Atlantic and waters around Europe was basically free game for German U-boats. In fact, on May 7, 1915, the RMS Lusitania was actually sunk by a U-boat off the coast of Ireland. This angered the U.S., mainly Woodrow Wilson, who threw the United States into the war. But it also angered the U.S. more, for most of their merchant ships were just being sunk by the U-boats without hesitation. Because of this, all the lights were turned off on Olympic, and the passengers were restricted from smoking at night due to avoid the possibility of a light from the lighter being visible from the scope of a U-boat ready to attack. Toward the end of Olympic's first year from carrying troops from Halifax, Britannic was ready to pick up wounded soldiers again. 
and on the morning of November 21st, 1916, off the island of Ki in Greece, she struck a mine and began quickly sinking. She sank in only 55 minutes with a low but still tragic death toll of 30. The deaths on her were caused by her propellers as the lifeboats were launched without Captain Charlie Bartlett's permission and they were sucked in. She was the largest ship sunk in World War I. Tension was now on the rise. If Olympic were to make it out of the war alive, she would have to go back into the transatlantic crossing service without any running mates. She would continue to serve throughout 1917, and even in December, she would narrowly escape the Halifax explosion by leaving port five days before the event. If she had been lost because of the explosion, it would have been a major loss for North America, for they relied on her to getting across. The citizens of Halifax nicknamed her for her actions in the war, Old Reliable, as she would always be there to assist in what she was always meant to do, cross all different kinds of people from one place to the other. In April 1918, Olympic was westbound headed for New York when she was attacked by a U-boat, and by some miracle, the torpedo was a dud, and Olympic narrowly escaped before they were able to load a new torpedo to attempt a second fire. Then on the return voyage, she was traveling on the English Channel when she spotted an enemy sub, U-103. The 103 was struggling to load a torpedo to fire. She was spotted by Olympic which turned sharply to starboard and rammed into the sub and sank it. On November 11, 1918, World War I finally ended. An Olympic was immediately put back to work bringing Canadian and American troops back home. After that, she returned to Britain, where she was repainted in her civilian colors with the traditional red, black, yellow, and white for White Star Line. During her three and a half years of her war career, she carried 132,000 Canadian and American troops and brought back 58,000 Canadians home. This work took its toll on her, but she still went on as being brought back as a passenger liner. And for the next 15 years, Olympic would enjoy the longest period of uninterrupted Atlantic commercial travel she would ever see. Every new ship that seemed to be built in the 1920s was exceeding what Olympic was trying to do, and the Great Depression did not help her at all. Fewer passengers started boarding her, and the money for the White Star Line dropped drastically. In the early morning hours of May 15, 1934, Olympic was nearing the coast of the United States. This crossing was shrouded in very thick fog, and for several minutes, you can hear through the thick fog the sound of the Nantucket lightship guiding other ships to port. The Olympic's whistle had bursted out across the Nantucket shoals. The Nantucket lightship was 600 meters ahead. Olympic stopped her engines, but they knew it was too late. She began slowly drifting through the water, slowly slowing down. Then her knife edge bow sliced through the lightship. A lifeboat had been quickly launched to pick up survivors who dove off the lightship before it was hit. It sank straight to the bottom, taking seven men with her. The surviving crew of the sinking was brought onto the Olympic. In the same year, White Star Line was forcefully merged with Cunard, and two years later, Olympic was deemed redundant and outdated. Ships like the Queen Mary and the SS Normandy were faster and were about a hundred and a half feet more longer than Olympic. Her interior fittings were sold at an auction, and finally, she was sold for scrap. But for her history and legacy, she was given a final send-off. Her former captain, John Binks, was brought back to be on her for her final voyage to the scrapyard. In April 1935, with a final career of 24 years in service, Olympic was finally broken up. It was a solemn end to such a massive and iconic vessel, long forgotten and now only mentioned in conspiracy theories and overshadowed by her younger sister, the Titanic. But in my opinion, with everything she went through, she was the real unsinkable. 
though some of her interiors are actually still around on display at locations around the British Isles, most notably the White Swan Hotel. But I will most likely never visit these, for I am not a traveler. I'm just a piece of toast in the internet. <laughs>